If you look at nature, there are some stunning color effects. Rainbows are amazing things. Stunningly bright, vivid butterflies from South America. Dragonflies, how do they achieve those gorgeous greens? We just need to know. If you take a butterfly and you look at its wing scales, it's got very tiny wing scales, about 50 microns by 100. We found that within the wing scale, which is more or less fingernail material, the butterfly had created tiny sculpted structures, nanostructures, which gave interference, which gave diffraction. Those effects combined can give you a, a variety of different vivid color effects. From the electron microscope images, we discovered an intricate structure in the wing scale of the morpho butterfly. And what we decided to do was to replicate that on a much larger scale. Here we have a structure corresponding to the scale of the wavelength of microwaves with details, ridges, and with these Christmas tree structures internally. Then when we shine microwaves at this, it responds like light does to the butterfly wing scale. By unraveling the butterflies, we discovered a whole raft of new metamaterial type structures. If you structure matter on a fine enough scale, it doesn't respond in the simple way like a bucket of water or a piece of aluminium. It has new properties, new optical properties, new properties for different wavelengths. There was a fascinating paper by some South African scientists who were looking at a particular moth. It's got a gold, metallic gold spot on its wing, and it turns out that it uses a zigzag grating, which is just basically a grating, and you zigzag it. Zigzag gratings haven't really been studied before, and they're fascinating. They have weird polarization properties, odd diffraction properties. We then make zigzag gratings, we then metallize them, and they have very interesting optical diffractive properties. If flat silver is placed into the scatterometer, all we would see is reflected green light. If we pattern the silver surface with a grating, then what we see on the screen is some missing portions of light. The light has gone into exciting surface plasmons. Scaling up from the visible to microwaves, we make samples of this kind. These scatter microwaves as the butterfly wings scatter light, but if we now metallize these, they will have very different properties, properties which you would not achieve in a butterfly wing scale. They will reflect microwaves in particular directions. They will stop certain frequencies of microwaves. You can even make lighthouses, if you like, of microwaves, so you can steer them around. This is useful in a variety of applications, one of which is in RFID tagging. RFID tags are going to be placed on many objects to keep records of where they are, stock checking, movement of goods, drugs, blood samples, etc. Conventional RFID tagging, the success rate of monitoring a large number of RFID tags can be as low as 70-75%. By using these structured metal surfaces, we've raised that success rate to well above 99.9%, .9%, which is really a massive improvement. Our most recent work is to combine the um, pattern metal surfaces and the surface waves they have with some of this, these new ideas in what are called transformation optics, theoretical developments in recent years, where you take um, an ordinary optical design and you use a new mathematical approach to design new types of structures. Uh, and one of the things we're playing with most recently is a, an object called a Lundberg lens on a surface, which if you shine a surface wave, which is a plane wave at the lens, it focuses it to the point on the circumference of the lens. I go around from place to place to talking about physics and I find that from three-year-olds to 93-year-olds, they're still fascinated. How does it all work? That's it, isn't it? How does it all work? So the theory for a perfect lens actually originates in about the 1960s, a guy called Victor Vesselago. He said that you could get something called a negative refractive index, which essentially means that when you look at a prism or something like that, light tends to bend a certain way. And he proposed that you could get light to bend the other way if you so wanted. And this is the basis behind a perfect lens. Current limitations with optical microscopy are mainly due to the, something called the diffraction limit, which was devised by a guy called Ernst Abbe in 1873. Now the problem with that is, is that light is a wave and as a wave it diffracts in certain ways and the fraction of it means that you can only resolve down to a very small spot but a fixed size of spot. So you can get to about 200 nanometers across and that's about, well, we're talking millionths of a millimeter. 
and you can't go any further than that due to the wave-like nature of light, so that's a big problem. The refractive index of a material is how much light slows down when it travels through such a material. So the light is travelling from air and into water, and when it, um, when it hits the surface, it reflects a little bit, but it also transmits, and it bends at an angle that's related to the difference in refractive index between the two materials. Now water and pretty much all materials in nature have what's called a positive refractive index. So what's happening here is the light is going from air into water and you can see that the light is bending towards the normal when it enters the more dense material which is the, which is the T. If this wasn't T but a negative refractive index material something different would happen. The light wouldn't be on the left hand side of the normal, it would instead be on the right. So light would come in this way, but then bend back on the opposite side to the surface normal. The actual idea for a perfect lens, for it to be used to image things, came up with a guy called Sir John Pendry um, in about late 1990s, and it was demonstrated in early 2000s. And this idea basically uses a metamaterial, so a material that's comprised of very small structures, much smaller than a wavelength of light. And by arranging those structures in certain ways, you can amplify light waves and get them to diffract the wrong way. And you can see images you wouldn't normally be able to see on a much smaller scale. With nanotechnology, you're dealing with things that you can't see. So it's really important that you have these tools that allow you to see a, a nanoparticle inside a cell that's really complex. So if you're doing bulk measurements, um, just on a lab bench, it's difficult to interpret the results and that's where microscopy and good optical uh, or high resolution optical microscopy and electron microscopy are so important um, and more so now that we're dealing more with nanotechnology. So we look at the interface between nanotechnology and immune cells using nanomaterials to try and control the responses where the body decides, the immune system decides whether it's going to attack an infection or a cancer or whether it's not going to. And the reason that's a nanotechnology or a, na a nanoscale problem is because what these high resolution microscopies are beginning to reveal is that there are a lot of exceedingly small structures, so down to the level of tens of nanometers or less. And these structures are critical to the way cells talk to each other. So when your immune system decides whether it's going to attack something, there are spatial structures at that size which are helping to mediate that decision. So the combination of, so the ability to image those is vital to understanding that and it's also vital to understanding how to control, how to control that, that process if you want to for therapeutic reasons. In our group we're interested in looking at the interaction between a cell and nanoparticles and you can't currently see that in the conventional optical microscope but if you could watch where an individual nanoparticle is interacting with the cell, what compartments it's going into, what effect it has on the cell structure, um, that would be really interesting to do in a live cell. And cells when they're alive, they're generally quite transparent and colourless. So you'll have to stain them if you want to see them and that is actually obviously influencing the cell itself. And you don't want to do that because then it starts messing with the processes. Not only are the imaging techniques coming online, but also nanotechnology techniques that enable us to build structures on the same size as these vital structures mean that we can interact directly with these little features. We can control their si help try to control their size or to pull them around or to position them. And so this, these two technologies coming in parallel should really, really show some exciting results. Perfect lensing principles have actually been demonstrated already on things like up to maybe 20, 30 nanometers, which is already a good something like 10 times below the diffraction limit. So we've shown that it works. It's just going to take a bit more time and maybe a little bit of a, someone's clever idea to make it actually a reality. At our textiles nanotechnology laboratory, we work on understanding fundamental chemical and physical phenomena that happens at dimensions below 100 nanometers. And it happens that this phenomena is highly relevant to polymer and fiber science. And what we want to do is to specifically aim this knowledge to modify existing materials, to create new fibers, and to develop new measuring techniques for this phenomena. And we are very fortunate that we are located in the Department of Fiber Science and Apparel Design. So we closely interact with students and colleagues that work on apparel design.
There are many advantages of using nanotechnology in textiles because we can impart functionalities to textiles in a more controlled manner and with less raw materials. We can also create new functionalities. We, in our lab, we like to manipulate fibers into doing things they don't like to do. For example, we can make cotton to kill bacteria, we can make cotton to conduct electricity, we can make cotton to serve as an electrochemical transistor, or cotton to capture toxic gases or active compounds such as vitamins or cosmetics. So many advantages to use this knowledge at the nanoscale and apply it into larger surfaces like textiles. I believe that the interactions between scientists and designers are extremely important because these interactions can create spaces of incredible intellectual and creative wealth. Scientists and designers follow two different ways of thinking, two philosophies. And if we combine those two philosophies, we can make our science more relevant and appealing to the community. Uh, scientists used to tackle a problem, a big problem, by dividing the big problem into smaller problems, we find local solutions and then we compile these local solutions into a bigger solution. But designers have a more holistic approach. They see the final, the final concept from a larger perspective and they can actually come back down to the details. By taking advantage of these two approaches we can, and interacting together, we can provide solutions to problems that are not possible by either a scientist or a designer working by themselves. And I can say that I'm a better scientist and my science is better because I've worked and interacted with designers. Well, that's a difficult question because most of, I want to think that most of my projects are very exciting. But uh, my favorite molecule is cellulose and specifically cotton. And we have worked on making cotton antibacterial against E. coli and Staphylococcus uh, bacteria. Uh, we have also created color without using dyes or pigments, just using nanoparticles. We have made uh, cotton electrically conductive and also use cotton as a substrate to create um, electrochemical transistors. And we created cotton into a structure capable of capturing gases in a very selective manner and encapsulated compounds like medicines or vitamins or cosmetics. On the basic level, we also have discovered very unique phenomena uh, and developed new techniques to measure existing phenomena that can produce better lubricants, better anti-static treatments, and better coatings for textiles. All these projects involve a large number of students over many years, students with different backgrounds, international collaborators, and funding agencies that have made all, this, all of them possible. If so, I think these creations can see the high street. Um, we produce mostly chemistry that is water-based and that can be replicated using existing textile manufacturing facilities. We are a university and our main goal is to produce science and train the next generation of scientists. But by working with companies and industries that have licensed these technologies or hired our students, they have been able to incorporate these new developments into their production lines. There are many challenges uh, for the interaction between scientists and designers um, because we are training totally different approaches and philosophies so we have developed different sets of values of what is important to each one. For example, for a scientist getting a publication in a high impact journal and getting a lot of citations from your colleagues can be a very worthy goal. But for a designer, having a very well critiqued and publicized collection or exhibit can be equally important. The trick is to respect each other's disciplines, and I believe that we can achieve better outcomes by interacting together. And, and take a look that I don't say working, I say interacting, because that's the key. Uh, it's these two disciplines interact at each step, instead of simply dividing the task, we can achieve a better outcome. If you use the approach, I do this and you do this, this approach is only additive. You are adding expertise and skills. But by interacting with each other, we can create a multiplier effect, a much more powerful outcome. Uh, perhaps the issues of scales and dimensions uh, is a difficult challenge because we see small things and they see bigger things. 
uh, we see the world with different magnifying lenses. So, but it's a great and fun experience, sometimes frustrating, sometimes challenging. Uh, I will say that other challenges can be people in your own discipline or in your own community that have a very traditionalist or Puritan view of your field. So I will tell you, when I started working in these endeavors of collaboration, I was given a warning by people in the science side that I was wasting my time working with designers. And I was reminded by the designers that I was not one of them. Um, but the key is to smile and to move on and, and use that, believe that these multiplying talents can be a worthy goal. As I mentioned before, I'm a better scientist because of these experiences with designers. I still produce my scientific papers, my patents, my developments coming from a lab in a scientific traditional environment, but now I can make science more relevant to the community. And I can argue that it's equally complex to design a molecule than to design a dress. We just need different type of skills and, and, and interests. And we can work together, this can make happen and have, can produce an outcome that is not possible but each one working by themselves. So the, the future is exciting and unpredictable uh, because now, with, because of nanotechnology, now we have unique control of matter at the nanoscale. So we can create unique functionalities in clothing that were not possible before. We can make clothing to be an interactive surface that can serve, for example, as an electronic sensor without using wires. We can create textiles that can give you medicine when you sleep in your pajamas, textiles that will never get dirty, that can change the shape or the color as a response to an external or internal stimuli. I personally see a lot of potential in creating this type of fashion that responds. Many, many areas or industries can benefit of these developments because we are using fibers, and fibers are the raw materials that is, are present in many, many products, from a toothbrush to pillows to air filters to shoes to carpets to even airplane structures are made of fibers. So I think these developments can be transferred to these industries and create new changes, enough new functionalities in different fields like preventative health disease control, homeland security, medical and biological applications, and all of them can be great beneficiaries of these uh, unique developments. I would like to see the garments not as an external object. I would like to see garments as being like a second skin, a skin that will react to your body, but also will react to the external stimuli. So if I'm in an environment that I, I, I need to be red, I can be color red, if I'm feeling sick, I can, this same garment can provide me with the medicine. If I'm feeling cold, the same garment will provide me with heat. So this type of interactions to see the garment as a second skin is what I, we aim in our lab to produce. In this paper, we analyze the development and application of nanotechnology in the field of anti-cancer treatment. Uh, nanotechnology has been widely applied in almost all the fields across the whole economy, and including this uh, uh, anti-cancer treatment field. And uh, um, especially, we notice that nanotechnology is going to play an more and more important role in the field of anti-cancer treatment. Uh, as we know, the mortality rate of most cancers is rather high. When other treatment, other tra traditional treatment fails, doctors are looking for new solutions from the emerging technologies. So nanotechnology opens a uh, new door in offering a more effective treatment. Nanotechnology is, uh, is called also key enabling uh, technology, which means that it can be applied in uh, almost all the industries. A nanometer is very tiny, it's one billionth of a meter, and it's about uh, 100 thousandths of the, uh, the width of a higher. In our study, we use publication and citation data collected from scopes covering uh, 13 years, uh, including seven uh, 
uh, cancer fields and uh, 16, techno uh, 16 types of uh, nanotechnologies. Uh, in some field of uh, um, cancer treatment, if the mortality rate is higher than others, we noted that there is a very high uh, nano citation intensity in this field. However, if the, um, um, the mortality rate is relatively lower in some certain um, cancer field, and then the nano citation intensity is also lower. So which means that in those most dangerous cancer fields, doctors are really looking, uh, looking new solutions from, uh, uh, na uh, from nanotechnology. We noticed there were two main uh, technological trajectory uh, waves. The first one was in 2000s, and including only one type of uh, anti-cancer uh, therapy. And then the second wave happened after 2006, even including more type of uh, even including more types of uh, anti-cancer uh, therapies. Which means that uh, in recent years, doctors have noticed that the uh, power of nanotechnology. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, I'm glad to share uh, some of our experience in developing uh, sensors for biomedical applications. Mm, NASA Ames Research Center is, uh, is one of the nine NASA centers um, in the U.S. And we are located in, in Silicon Valley, okay, very close to Google and Intel and about 10 minutes from you know Stanford so there I run a nanotechnology group and um, we have a lot of activities going on uh, I'm, I'm going to focus just um, the biosensor activities for uh, biomedical applications uh, I also have uh, um, you know strong collaboration with uh, uh, Pohang University of Science and Technology uh, postdoc in Korea um, I have some parallel activities there. Uh, I have graduate students and uh, 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 in developing a bio field effect transistor. So it's somewhat of a competitive technology to what I'm doing uh, at NASA. There are two competing technologies. Uh, I really don't have any preference, you know, one over the other. Uh, you, know, you treat them like you treat your children. You don't give any preference. But in the market may decide completely, you know, differently. That's a different story. And um, so I'm going to give an overview of uh, all of those activities. Okay. So first of all, you know, what is the criteria for a very uh, well designed um, biosensing system? in the marketplace. Uh, first of all, uh, small size and mass and um, uh, low power consumption, especially if it is going to be a portable unit and if you want to integrate it with a smartphone, um, then it has got to be uh, low power consumption. Um, again, minimal resources, minimal chemical resources and uh, minimal you know, human processing. Because if it has got to go to commercial level at the user level, uh, and if the public has to use it, then you cannot design a system which requires a PhD, uh, you know, for operation. So, um, you know, fairly well automated. Uh, reasonably rapid analysis, so that you know, it doesn't take too long. Uh, negligible false alarms. And uh, if possible, you know, multiplexing capability to do multiple things. But you've got to be very careful because as scientists and engineers, you know, we think, you know, we can design a chip which will do nine things, okay. Um, you know, that's a wonderful goal, but I'm not so sure whether it is a good idea for us to try so hard because, you know, we are not the ones ultimately decide um, everything beyond us, okay. It's not just the marketplace, it's a business development. What it is, is right now actually there is healthcare, at least in the U.S., is so expensive, okay. Everything is done. Uh, you know, by people wearing lab coats, and so their salaries are high. 
the insurance costs are high, so on and so forth. So if you are going to bring something, you know, which is going to do at least one thing right, automated, that alone is going to save costs. Okay, but all of a sudden, if you actually you know, do something which is going to make nine things, okay, the companies may not want to actually push it out in the market because there is not money, you know, to be made. Remember, the companies are there to make money. They are not there actually as a charitable organization. So. <coughs> There are, there are a lot of factors beyond you and me, okay? So that's why multiplexing is very hard. Uh, you know, if you can't make it work, you know, don't feel bad. That's all I'm trying to say, okay? And um, so, uh, you know, multiplexing. And then uh, uh, reliability is, is, is very important. And ultimately, a technology that is going to allow you to, you know, mass produce these devices so you can keep the cost fairly low, okay? So those are essentially the... Um, uh, 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 the goals, okay. So the first type of sensor that I'm going to talk about is a nano electrode array, um, you know, for biosensors. So these nano electrode arrays are, um, uh, you know, it's a, a using electrochemical techniques, okay, whether it is the impedance spectroscopy or cyclovoltometry or amperometry, whatever. And uh, so people have been using carbon-based electrode for about 100 years. So why would you want to have another electrode, um, especially a nano electrode? Um, okay. What it is is the, the, the electrical engineers, you know, will tell you that, um, you know, the noise is proportional to the surface area. So you take a, tra a traditional microelectrode or macroelectrode um, and you have very tiny biomolecules that, that you want to detect. And uh, so you have a large area and you have a large noise and you have a very tiny signal. Um, on the other hand, you take the same microelectrode and you divide that into so many different nanoelectrodes. Now, now the size difference between your, uh, you know, molecule and the electrode, um, you know, goes down, and you significantly enhance, you know, the signal to uh, to noise uh, ratio. And again, you know, there are multiplexing, you know, opportunities. So, what is it that you can use for materials here? Um, if you think of using single wall carbon nanotubes, uh, you know, looking at pictures of SEM, you always notice that the single wall car carbon nanotubes, they look like spaghetti on a plate, okay. So it's very hard actually to have, you know, controlled electrochemistry on single wall carbon nanotubes, you know, controlling the size and also putting the functionalities uh, and other kind of things. Even the multi wall nanotubes, you know, grow like uh, towers. Uh, and if, if they happen to be fairly big towers, um, all the electro, all the nanotubes are right next to each other. Um, on the other hand, um, carbon nanofibers, you know, uh, are silicon uh, nanowires or zinc oxide nanowires, and if you can grow them nice and vertical, okay, and um, what it is is you have one electrode here, and then you have an identical electrode, nano electrode. Um, exactly at a distance apart, you know, the distance that you choose. What it is is you can do a simple back of the envelope calculation. You know, for a 50 nanometer electrode, the radial diffusion layer in electrochemistry requires that the neighboring electrode should be at least about one and a half micron apart. So that way these two will act like individual electrodes. If they're any closer together, the diffusion layer of this electrode will overlap with the diffusion layer of the next electrode, then if they all overlap, then it will begin to deviate from an ideal nano electrode, and all the diffusion layers, when they merge, then they will behave like a micro electrode. Okay, so that is the biggest issue. So, it, it, the it, the vertical carbon nanofibers, the vertical silicon nanowires, the vertical zinc oxide nanowires, whatever is your material of choice. Okay. I'm not going to argue with you about one versus the other, okay? It all depends on your level of, um, uh, you know, confidence and, uh, 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 you know, qualifications, you know, how far you have advanced, okay? We have worked uh, with carbon nanofibers long enough that we feel very comfortable uh, working uh, with them, okay? Um, so that's why generally I don't enter into academic arguments about one material versus the other because there, are, there could be compromises. So the way we do this is, is fairly simple. Um, we start out with the silicon wafer. We used to do four inch wafer, now we do in a six inch wafer. And then we, you know, deposit a metal film, you know, titanium, tungsten, tantalum, you know, 
so typically like in microelectronics and then we put the catalyst deposition for carbon nanotube growth or nanofiber. Um, so here we use you know, nickel, we pattern the catalyst and then we use plasma CVD and then we grow vertical carbon nanofibers. Okay. And uh, these carbon nanofibers uh, are about 50 nanometers and they are about uh, one and a half micron apart. And then we fill the gap between these nanofibers with silicon dioxide using TRCVD. Okay. So th that serves two purposes. One is that you can get electrical isolation between the neighboring uh, electrodes. That's one thing. The second thing also during operation, uh, you know, it has got a mechanical uh, you know, robustness. So the nanotube actually doesn't fall down you know, like a you know, grass on a rainy day. Okay. And, uh, so, um, so those are the two advantages and then we do chemical mechanical polishing that exposes a tiny bit of uh, 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 carbon nanofiber. Okay. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, you know the small whiskers on a teenager's face, okay, the <laughs> hair growth. So that's what it looks like. So if you take a look at uh, a top view of the SEM image, so these white dots that you see are the carbon nanofibers poking out maybe a couple of nanometers and then it is actually on a sea of silicon dioxide. So this is the one that we package and so you can bring your probes and you can attach these probes. You know the probes could be again depending on the target and depending on what is it that you want to use for a probe. It could be a DNA probe, it could be protein, it could be antibody, it could be aptamer, uh, that anything that you want and uh, so this is a carbon chemistry so you have to have your own protocol to attach the probe. Okay. And, and then you bring your target when they hybridize, um, essentially you can do cyclob altimetry or you do electrochemical you know, impedance spectroscopy. Okay, so this is a nano electrode. Um, so I'm going to give you in you know, a couple of quick examples. You know, uh, troponin is one of the um, uh, biomarkers um, for for heart disease. We have done all three: you know, troponin, uh, myoglobin, and cardiac reactive protein. And we have done both the cyclovoltometry and also uh, impedance spectroscopy. Uh, and I'll use the impedance spectroscopy to explain. So the bare electrode uh, is the blue color, and then after you attach the antibody for troponin, uh, that is the purple color, and then you get the impedance um, basically. Uh, in a concentration dependent in, in a impedance uh, for um, uh, for when you bring the uh, in a troponin uh, target and um, so uh, these are various concentrations and the lowest concentration that you see in a 0.25 nanogram per ml uh, itself is um, you know well below what the medical community is looking for and so this is uh, uh, done with the laboratory this thing we have since then done in a, a, a human serum and that hasn't been published so I don't have the data yet. With the human serum actually the concentration levels are in a bit higher uh, but not in a terribly bad but still under the, uh, the limits um, the medical community is looking for. And the next one is a cardiac reactive protein again in a similar um, uh, curves uh, um, you know the bare electrode and then uh, after the uh, uh, antibody attachment and then in a concentration dependent uh, uh, impedance spectroscopy uh, uh, curves. Uh, recently um, just uh, end of February uh, a visiting scientist that I had from uh, uh, India you know he finished a multiplexing operation. We have a nine, um, 3 by 3 array uh, I think I have an electrode here yeah so essentially this is what it looks like a 3 by 3, ele uh, three um, uh, uh, electrodes and um, you know with the contact pads looking like this. Um, so he used the first three uh, for myoglobin and the middle three for the uh, cardiac reactive protein and the bottom three for, for troponin. So we are just in the process of uh, analyzing the, uh, the results. Um, so this is actually the old processing that uh, view graph four inch wafer but now we uh, migrated to a six inch wafer so we get uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 chips you know from from each effort uh, and, and in fact uh, you know one without patterning is the one that I brought um, a couple of days ago and gave it to Ravivan and I'm hoping uh, that she could do her cancer diagnostics uh, work using one of these chips. Hopefully we should be able to give her a, these pattern chips also in the future. Uh, so as you can see uh, uh, this is a one approach for lab on a chip applications. Um, early cancer detection is a potential, so that is one of the things that I'm hoping to do uh, with uh, Ravi Wan's help here. 
Um, environmental monitoring, it is something that we are working on currently. Pathogen de detection, we have already done things like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to, okay. Uh, for uh, ricin detection, uh, we have already done the work. And we are also uh, beginning to look at, you know, food quality monitoring. Because food quality monitoring in many cases, uh, you can convert the problem into water quality monitoring because uh, many of the contamination, uh, you know, if you take a cabbage, uh, things don't go all the way into the, you know, to the center and uh, this is what I was told. Okay, so uh, as an engineer, you know, I don't have any knowledge about some of these things. I just learn from other people. So this is more or less like a surface contamination. So what it is, is uh, these food companies, uh, the food processing centers, they essentially do a quick wash using pure water and then they collect that uh, you know wash water and then they do analysis using instruments so now you take that water and then you do um, uh, use this one of these biosensor chips okay whether it is e coli or salmonella or you know some other bacteria protozoa or whatever that you are looking at so the point i'm trying to make is you can do food quality monitoring essentially by converting the problem into a um, you know water quality monitoring uh, type problem okay so you can see there are a variety of um, uh, applications for for this uh, type of uh, biosensor so moving along that I want to talk about the competitive technology from my Korean group, okay? And so this is something that I've done in the last three or four years. So in the NASA approach, there are two things. You know, one is that we were using an electrode, you know, it's electrochemical. The second thing is we were using a material, exotic material like a carbon nanofiber. Whereas on the other hand, so this is just your simple FET, okay, field of a transistor you know, similar to what we have on our, you know, computer chips, okay. The only difference is in the computer chip, you know, the, 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 the FET we have, the transistor we have is dry, okay. Whereas if you're going to do bioanalysis of any kind, you'll be dealing with water or, or urine or, 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 or uh, blood, okay. So this is going to be a wet FET, okay. So in that sense, you know, you have a source and you have a drain, but you replace your standard uh, dry gate you know, with the uh, uh, reservoir area with uh, uh, where you can put your uh, electrolyte or liquid or, you know, whatever sample it is. And then you also, you know, fabricate a reference electrode. Most people, fabric, you know, have a reference electrode which is pretty much separate. But in, uh, in POSEC, you know, we have exceptional um, nanofabrication capabilities. So when we fabricate an 8 inch wafer, we also fabricate a reference electrode right on the chip. So it does not have to be external. So we do all of these things and um, the advantages are you don't need to do any kind of labeling and uh, there is no expensive you know, micro uh, uh, you know, readers. So the way the FET, BioFET works is you have a, um, when you operate it, you know, without any uh, of the electrolyte or any of the antibody or anything, you have your standard current voltage characteristics for a given gate voltage. But now when you attach an antibody and you measure the current voltage characteristics, it will shift a little bit, okay. The electrical engineers will call it, you know, threshold voltage shift. And then when the, um, uh, uh, the target and the um, uh, probe, when they hybridize, there will be a further shift. So this shift will be unique. Okay? It is still important that you do all the surface protocol correctly, so there is no non-specific binding. Okay? So just because you have a wonderful electrode or just because you have a wonderful biofet, that doesn't mean selectivity is automatically guaranteed because you know, if you have a target or if you have a probe which sticks everywhere and then you have a lousy surface in the neighboring area, you are going to have a you know, binding from all over and they may contribute to the current and that may confuse the signal. Okay? So no matter what you use, you know, for your diagnostics, it is your responsibility to make sure that the surrounding surfaces are such that, you know, you don't get into the problem of non-specific binding. So that's always an issue, you got to work with them, okay. Uh, so this is a device fabrication, I don't have time to go through all of that, but uh, I just want to point out that right over the gate area, there is a small reservoir, you know, where you put your sample, okay. Otherwise, it's a standard source, drain, everything. What we have here unique is um, uh, the silicon nano wire, okay. So that's what we use for uh, the material. It's not a 
silicon thin film like you uh, you have in your computer chips, but it is a silicon nano wire. But this silicon nano wire is not a bottom up nano wire, it is not grown using catalyst because as wonderful and as sexy as it sounds and you can get a nature paper. I honestly do not think it will any time be viable or technically uh, uh, it is going to be commercialized in God knows how long okay, because it is very difficult to do it on large scale wafer and uh, yeah, it is just a waste of time at this point. Okay. Uh, on the other hand I do not have the patience, I am an engineer and I generally do not pay that much attention to uh, nature and science papers and um, so. Uh, I, I like to see something in my hand which I can hold as quickly as possible. So what it is is the top down processing is much easier because it is very well known. The only difference between the standard top down processing at Intel and the one that we do at Postec is that one in Intel is thin film here we make them into nano wires and I will show you how the nano wires look like. Um, Okay, so this is what the nano wires uh, uh, look like. We have actually a couple of different uh, approaches to do. So on the on the channel area, so that is the width going in that direction. We use 10 or 20 nano wires. Each nano wire is like 10 nanometer diameter. Okay. One thing that you got to keep in mind is when you are doing a biosensor and you are talking about a transistor, remember you you are not constrained by Moore's law. Moore's law is for the computer chips okay, make it smaller and smaller and smaller. But here our goal is different, we still got to be able to put one drop of blood or one drop of urine or one drop of water okay. One drop you know takes a lot of uh, uh, area and, and, and volume okay. So we do not need to make the source and the drain right next to each other like Intel is trying to do today okay. They could be fairly far apart. Okay, they could be like one micron apart or even a couple of micron apart. But one thing that you got to keep in mind is if you have two microns apart and you have a 10 nanometer wire, it might look you know, behave like a bamboo pole and it could you know it could just flex and or it could even break. Okay. So the students I had at POSEC they came up with a very clever idea instead of having these kind of straight line nano wire they also have a, a, a honeycomb like a, you know nano wire. So essentially it looks like a honeycomb but it is not a big deal you you know when you do lithography you use a CAD drawing and instead of doing you know straight line nano wires you know they do a, um, a, a, a honeycomb on the CAD drawing and then you do the etching they can make a honeycomb type nano wire. So this is basically not only mechanically more stable but it also supports um, you know, the supporting surface area is much higher so it can hold more, more volume of your um, uh, probe and the target and so on and so forth. So that is what the device structure looks like. I think I will skip all of these things. So um, the first one is in a carcinoma uh, uh, embryonic antigen. So the three curves that I was talking about uh, you know the, the one on the right most is your uh, standard um, uh, IV curve and then after you put the um, antibody uh, and then after you have you know the target. Um, so uh, the expanded version um, shows um, uh, you know these curves in you know, a nice and uh, separate. The sensing limit uh, for CEA that we got using the FET is you know 5 atom molar. Okay. I think the sensitivity uh, of the biofet uh, would be higher than the carbon nanofiber electrode. You know based on uh, you know we have not done a one to one comparison yet uh, but you know my gut feeling is that this will work um, you know, much more sensitive. Uh, it is also you know since it is a silicon base and you can do it on 8 inch wafer I have a feeling this will be probably closer to the market in Korea faster than the one that I could do in Silicon Valley okay. Um, so that is that is what I think and um, uh, we have also done uh, AFP and uh, I do not have time to go through all of these things and a um, couple of things that, that I want to talk about I, I, I will not have time to talk about things in detail. So far the biomedical application that I talked about is um, uh, I, I keep forgetting to use the microphone but I think you know my voice is loud enough it, it carries all the way to the end it is a small room. So that is based on you know liquid analysis okay. On the other hand the medical community in recent years has been 
coming up with increasingly, uh, you know, more and more biomarkers in, 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 in human breath. Okay? Again, as an engineer a few years ago, when somebody told me that a human breath has got about, I don't know, something like 200, 300 organic compounds, I was astonished. And uh, apparently what it is is some of these organic, I mean, the, 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 the uh, constituents of the, um, our breath, uh, uh, they can act like biomarkers. For example, um, acetone in diabetes, uh, in a patients, uh, they generally have excess amount of acetone in their breath compared to normal population. And people who are going through kidney dialysis, they end up having excess amount of ammonia in their breath compared to normal population. So if you can do gas and vapor analysis, again, like what's going on here at Nanotech, because at Nanotech there are, a, there are two groups doing gas and vapor analysis. You know, one is focusing on uh, environmental monitoring like nitric oxide and, uh, and other kind of dirty things in the air. The other group is focusing on, you know, food <coughs> safety like looking at uh, things coming out of mangoes or, you know, whatever. But potentially you can also do biomedical using the same uh, setup that they have. You know, they, they just got to uh, do the training of the sensors, okay, for acetone or for ammonia. So it's still doable. Um, so we make uh, um, uh, uh, a a uh, you know, gas of vapor sensor. So it's a very simple one. It's a silicon based approach. Um, unlike an, uh, the tin oxide nano wires being used at nanotech, we use carbon nanotubes and so it enables room temperature operation so you don't have to heat it. Nevertheless, we build a, a you know, heater in there just to clean up. You know, every time when you have to clean up the sensor, you can use heating. Um, so this is like a bus bar electrode and interdigitated fingers and we purify the single wall carbon nanotubes and then we, we do uh, inkjet uh, uh, printing or drop casting. Um, so the way you do, see in, when you do biosensor the selectivity is guaranteed by choosing the probe. Okay? But on the other hand when you do gas and vapor analysis it is electronic nose, uh, a, you know, the selectivity um, is not guaranteed by a, uh, by a probe or anything. What it is is the, uh, it it functions like. Uh, okay, uh, how much time did I get? 20, 30 minutes. Twenty five. Okay, so I'll finish in a couple of minutes. Okay, so the the selectivity is is guaranteed, um, you know, by doing in you know, a pattern recognition. So the way we do that is um, I think I'll skip that. So we fabricate uh, one centimeter by one centimeter chip with 32 sensors, 8 here, 8 here, 8 here and 8 here and uh, but not all 32 of them are identical. You know, some of them have single wall carbon nanotubes, pristine, some of them have nanotubes with the palladium, some of them have nanotubes with the, you know, gold particles, so they are all different. So what it is is when you train them, the 32 sensors in the lab, they give 32 different responses and you save that in your um, you know, signal processing chip. And you repeat this for various concentrations, various humidity levels, and various temperatures, and then you later on you use it for you know use a pattern recognition algorithm. So that's the electronic nose approach, you know, which is what is going on here at Nanotech. Okay, except this is a much smaller chip with much more number of sensor elements. So. Uh, it also because of the carbon nanotubes, it is a room temperature sensitivity, and it can give better sensitivity. So this is something that I'm hoping to ship to nanotech. So the, the two groups here, uh, one on the uh, food quality and one on the environmental monitoring, they both can use these chips. So um, there were other things that I, oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention that we have already um, uh, done, um, put this, uh, the chem sensor chip on an iPhone. We delivered 30 prototype phones to Department of Homeland Security. And also uh, this chem sensor chip that I talked about, it is the one and only nanotechnology product that has been flown to outer space, okay? Because that chem sensor has been monitoring air quality in the International Space Station, you know, where the crew is uh, hanging around the small place and it monitors the air quality, particularly for formaldehyde because formaldehyde is something that comes from the tiles and the carpets and other things. And uh, um, uh, time average over one day is eight, uh, 1 ppm. Okay? There are no commercial sensors which can pick out formaldehyde 1 ppm. If formaldehyde accumulates, it gives you headache and nausea and all of that. Okay? So that's something. And um, 
so I'll, I'll skip all of these things and I'll leave the summary for you to read um, and I'll be happy to answer in you know, a few questions. Thank you, Professor Mayor Khan. So we have time for a couple of questions, please. Sample or real sample? That's real. Uh, so I mean, blood sample, whole blood. Uh, we have done. We have done yeah, both. Yeah. We have done uh, um, uh, uh, human samples too. Yeah. But, uh, but I, as in every case, you know, when you do the human samples, you know, your sensitivity would be somewhat worse. Your goal is to try to uh, get as close as possible, but. Generally, you know that that's very difficult. Okay, but the but the important thing is even with the uh, human sample, if you can get um, sensitivity, um, a detection limit uh, lower than what the medical community is looking for, then you you have done it. Okay, yep. because sometimes we we always again look for uh, things you know unrealistic goal. For example, in troponin. Uh, I don't see any reason why someone has to look for femtogram per uh, ml or, or, or even picogram per ml where a nanogram per ml is what a, the medical community is looking yeah, for. You, you uh, only mentioned sensitivity but specificity whatever, because uh, uh, there can be many uh, cross reactivity okay when you use a uh, whole blood in your parallel you know sense multi analyzed sensors huh? cross reactivity between yeah. sensors and sensors. Uh, if you use a whole blood, specificity, specificity is uh, more problem. What do you mean by a sensor Specific sensor? Specificity. No, I know, but what mm. it is, is you said sensor you, you sensor. Nanowire sense, you know, nanowire sensors, multi-analyzed nanowire sensors. Multi-analysis meaning when you have three by three? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, the three by three, the multi-analysis one, we just finished the work about a month ago. I, have, I, I, I haven't even seen the results yet. Yeah. More questions? All right, then. Um, let's thank our speaker, okay. Professor Mayapan, again.